After a sudden disaster, it's not uncommon to have a prolonged interruption of utility services. Electricity, water, and natural gas, they flow to our homes and sewage and trash get taken away. And we take for granted how finely tuned and efficient these systems are. Just last week, I was running out of my house in the morning in my bathrobe to get my trash cans out to the curb when I heard the trash truck coming down the street. I'm sure you can relate. Have you ever considered your plans if the grid were to go down and there was no trash pickup? What happens, however, when one or more of these systems fail? How and why do they fail? What does that mean to us? And most importantly, how should you prepare for these potential issues? We're gonna to try to answer all those questions in this video. In this video, I'll tell you how these vital services can fail, what items you should have in place, and I'll finish with a couple of real world examples, one in particular being a personal story. So let's examine the utility systems and where they are susceptible to failure. Electricity. It's pretty incredible. You can flip a switch, a circuit is activated, and you nearly instantly have a light, a running fan, or a stove. And even without our action, our refrigerators are kept cold. Traffic lights change and pumping stations move resources and waste. And it's so efficient that we often take it for granted, yet it's one of the first systems to fail after disaster. On August 14th of 2003, a high voltage power line in Northern Ohio caused a shutdown after brushing against overgrown trees. The failure to trigger an alarm led to three more lines sagging in the trees within an hour and a half, resulting in a massive blackout that affected 50 million people across southeastern Canada in eight northeastern states. Now, the outage caused at least 11 deaths and incurred an estimated cost of $6 billion. On February 5th of 2021, the Texas electrical grid experienced a devastating breakdown due to cold and a snowstorm. And the frigid conditions caused a series of events that plunged millions of Texans into darkness and freezing temperatures, leading to multiple fatalities, exposing the vulnerability of equipment unprepared for extreme cold. In 2017 and 18, equipment owned by another California utility, Pacific Gas and Electric, was blamed for causing a series of wildfires that killed more than 120 people and destroyed more than 27,000 homes and other buildings. Some communities were wiped out in just mere minutes, and hundreds of thousands were left without power. Now, I could list hundreds of more examples. Many are natural disaster related, some due to human error, some intentional attacks, and some cyber attacks. But most commonly, Electrical outages are often due to failing equipment. After all, most of the United States electrical grid was built in the 1960s and 70s. Over 70% 70 of the US electrical grid is over 25 years old. It was designed for different weather that has increasingly changed in the last several years as we've witnessed more extreme highs and lows. It absolutely will fail at some point in your area. That's a given. The question is really for how long and what will be affected. Without any backup electrical power in your home, you will immediately note the lights won't work. Though the clocks may have all stopped, there's a timer that sort of started on your refrigerator and freezer. If the doors stay closed, general guidelines from the Center for Disease Control indicate food will remain safe for up to four hours in a refrigerator, 48 hours in a full freezer, and 24 hours in a half full freezer. Now, depending on the food, it may have a longer unrefrigerated life. I always suggest people put half-filled plastic water bottles in their freezers. If the power goes out for more than four hours, this will buy you more time as the ice melts. Additionally, in a heat wave, there'll be an extra benefit to keep you cooler and hydrated. We just released a video discussing how to stay cool in the summer, and we've done plenty of videos on staying warm in the winter without power. But still, you will need a plan to prepare, cook, and eat food before it goes bad. Much of that cooking and prep will rely on electricity, so you've really got to factor this into your plans. You also need a source of light and communication with the outside world, like a radio. You won't be able to rely on the internet, cell towers, or cable television. Natural gas. Now, I started with electricity in this analysis of service interruptions because so many of the other systems rely upon electricity, from pumping stations to traffic lights and switchers. Natural gas is really one of those systems. Many natural gas lines, they have gas generations at major stations to keep the pipeline transmission system pressurized, but it is a ubiquitous. Many people erroneously assume that the natural gas system is still gonna work after disaster that robs everyone of electricity. Now I see this expressed repeatedly on several websites, but it is dangerously not true. It is a slightly more reliable system, but it's far from guaranteed. Across the 220,000 miles of high strength steel pipe, 
20 inches to 42 inches in diameter. There are the large main stations, compressor stations, 75 to 100 miles of boost of pressure in urban areas with additional gas distribution stations. And not all of these run pumps on natural gas. Most use electricity. Then there are also the automatic shutoff valves triggered by either earthquakes or pressure irregularities like a massive spike or decrease in pressure. If there is a line break, as many occur after a natural disaster, gas is interrupted or it's shut down to prevent possible explosions. And these valves are designed to automatically stop or restrict natural gas flow in an emergency such as a pipeline rupture, excessive pressure, or a sudden drop in pressure. Automatic shutoff valves, they really play a critical role in ensuring the safety and integrity of natural gas distribution systems by really quickly isolating the affected section of the pipeline and minimizing the risk of accidents or further damage. Most of these safety sensors rely upon electrical sensors to judge the safety of restoring the flow and may require a human to restart them manually. And if you live along a line solely powered by natural gas, barring any breaks in the lines, you should still have some pressure and flow. More than likely, you will not have natural gas. If your water heater, clothes dryer, heater, boiler, oven, stovetop, generator, fire pit, or grill are connected to the natural gas lines, they're not gonna likely be working anymore. There's also a significant safety issue if pipelines are broken after disaster. I would encourage you to know how to shut off the natural gas line to your house and have the tools to do so near your gas meter. If you rely upon natural gas to cook or heat your home, the two most critical uses, you're gonna need a different means to do so. You won't be able to switch to propane without a conversion kit installed because of differences in pressure, flow, and regulations between gases. Water. The municipal water supply is slightly more reliable as far as flowing to your home. City water is typically stored in an elevated water tower and distributed to homes through gravity. In the event of a power outage, only the water stored in the towers will be accessible, as water flow into homes relies on the pumping systems feeding those towers, which requires, you guessed it, electricity. That's the good news, but only about an average day's worth of water for a community is typically stored in these towers. Many disasters can adversely impact the municipal water supply. Water treatment plants that render raw or reclaimed water drinkable or potable can't operate efficiently without electricity. Floods and excessive rains can cause pollutants and sewage to flow into clean water pipes and supplies. And after a flood, even well water can become tainted. Most disasters, they can break water lines and prevent water from flowing further down the line. And as many experienced in Texas during the Snowmageddon, lines will freeze and water won't flow to their homes. Immediately before disaster strikes, let's say something like a hurricane or right after, filling all bathtub sinks and extra containers is really a good ideal. An emergency bathtub bladder can be deployed in a bathtub to provide between 65 to 100 gallons of drinkable water before lines are tainted or stop flowing. After that, you must follow emergency announcements in your senses to really monitor water safety. If the water looks or smells funny, you will want to treat it before use, even without official notice. You should expect that water will be likely tainted after a major disaster or one that stretches in the six hours or more. In addition to at least one gallon of stored water per day for each person and pet in your home, and that's just a bare minimum, you're gonna need a means to filter, treat, and purify water, even if it flows well from your tap. When the water goes out in a community, it's the first resource people truly realize that they desperately need. The realization will often come to them within the first 72 hours after disaster. Without electricity or natural gas, many will be forced to drink unclean water, which could harbor harmful viruses, amoebas, or bacteria. You can probably get by without electricity or natural gas, but you will quickly find yourself in a desperate situation without water. And because of this, I've done several videos on the subject, from proper stores and myths that you sometimes hear that I'm going to link to below. I'll also provide a link to these videos in the description and comments section. Sewer. Without flowing water, sewer systems will not operate well, if at all. Liquid waste will still spill over into the system, but solid waste will need supplemental water to flush. And with water as a precious resource, if it looks to be a prolonged aftermath of a disaster, I wouldn't waste water by flushing it down the toilet. This is another video where I have a video or two on the subject, so I'll link to it in the description and comments section below. After disaster, sewer lines, they can break, they can be flooded, or even backflow into clean systems 
or even into your home. It also can quickly pile up because people don't stop creating waste just because of a disaster. Less than a drop of human waste in your water supply can lead to disaster for many. Contaminated water and inadequate sanitation are connected to the spread of diseases like cholera, diarrhea, dysentery, hepatitis A, typhoid, and polio. And your sewer system is probably the most reliable of the infrastructure systems covered, but it's far from guaranteed. Even if yours is operating fine, if it's tied to other people's systems, you could experience problems. If significant flooding is involved in your specific disaster, you will experience problems. And I would encourage you to have a plan to safely remove or contain human waste for an extended period after any disaster. We did a video detailing how to handle human waste after disaster, again, which I'll link to in the description and comments section below. And I'd recommend you watch that if you haven't put together a plan yet. Trash. You tend to notice very quickly when trash pickup services stop. Modern humans, they create a lot of waste materials. And while cardboard and other packaging don't attract rodents right away or stink or become toxic, remember that without electricity, food will be turning bad. People will dispose of this food in their trash cans. Municipal trash cans are only designed to hold the typically week's worth of garbage. Without electricity, drivers are not going to be navigating the streets and traffic lights to get to your house to pick up your garbage. The trash is going to pile up everywhere. And that's just a minor problem in the first week, but in the second and third weeks and after, it really becomes a significant community health problem. And if you add high temperatures or heavy rain to the mix, the timeline to a health emergency rapidly accelerates. Now, I always suggest trash bags as a necessary preps. And beyond the typical kitchen trash bag, contractor grade trash bags are your best bet because they are sturdier and less acceptable to breaking. Trash bags can also be repurposed to protect you from the rain or to transport items securely. I would encourage you to bag your trash as densely as possible, seal it, and remove it from your livable area. If it's not safe to remove it from your home, burn it, bury it, or contain it in an outbuilding. You should store it in an unused area of your home until it can be removed safely. How it breaks down. If you watch my video on how to survive the first 90 days after a collapse, which I'll again link to below, you'll understand how these systems fell and in what order. The first to be noticed is electricity, but you have to keep in mind what is required to generate electricity. Fossil fuel power plants, they utilize coal or oil as fuel sources, employing combustion to produce heat. Now this heat is subsequently used to create steam, which powers turbines that in turn produce electricity. Now after a disaster, the fossil fuels required to generate the steam they're not going to be delivered. And that means that the plant must operate solely on its limited reserves. Also, you need to understand that the three main parts of the electrical grid, the generation, a high voltage transmission grid, and a distribution system, they require large and small components that must be replaced if they're damaged or fail. Shockingly high number of these components are sourced from, you guessed it, China. Any significant disruption in the supply chain, from impassable roads to global conflicts, they could leave power plants operating at decreased efficiency or not at all during an unknown duration. Now, not having electricity is really just an inconvenience initially, but refrigerated foods, they can spoil in just a few hours. And after eight hours or more, people will begin to understand that traffic lights, emergency services, and police, they're all stymied. So electricity is a big one, but along with it, you may also experience almost immediately an interruption of natural gas and water. And the first day without these services is more of an inconvenience to many, and people tend to hole up in their homes, but some even have community barbecues as they use their propane and charcoal barbecues to cook up all that meat in their freezer, turning bad by the minute. And that feeling of camaraderie and community, it can last into the second and part of the third day, but things begin to quickly devolve rather quickly by the third day. The stench of trash and human waste piling up compounds the stress and anxiety that many will feel. How bad it gets from there directly correlates to people's sense of relief efforts. If hope is on the horizon, the bridges and roads are clear and flowing with fresh food and water that's being trucked in, then things will probably right themselves. If that's not happening, people will begin to take what they need to survive by whatever means necessary. As early as the first day, grocery stores will be unable to transact and sell food, and trucks may not even be able to deliver the food. Grocery stores, they don't hold enough food to feed an entire community for several days after disaster anyways. And when the power goes out, restaurants will be closed as well. And you must rely upon your stored food and cooking and food prep skills. And even if you have a good skill set, set with these and ample supplies, it's not likely that all your neighbors are uh, skilled and supplied in the same way. And as a rule, 
One day is generally okay. A few days and people will come together. A week or more and it will either be relief workers or someone else at your door. And look, I don't want to say this to alarm you, but I need to be honest. Even if you have plugged in a few solutions, when these critical infrastructures, utilities go offline, that doesn't mean your neighbors have. And I also don't want to go into a great detail about other infrastructure systems impacted by these outages like hospitals, trucking, food supplies, etc. But we really take for granted what happens when we flick a light switch or open a tap on our sink. During the lockdowns, when we faced a huge unknown with COVID, uh, I had a friend who worked at a desalination plant in Carlsbad, California. He and his fellow employees, they were actually required to stay on the job and sleep at the plant at the start of the lockdowns because their jobs were too critical to allow them to come home and risk exposure to the illness. Now, I sometimes think about that, but I also think about how essential one person's job may be to an entire community. One person can be the linchpin to a whole infrastructure system. So what happens if that person can't be found after a disaster? When one infrastructure system fails, it can cascade into a collapse of multiple systems. At least it puts a significant strain on these other systems. If you remember New Orleans after Katrina, many police officers, they didn't report to their jobs because they decided instead to stay home and protect their families. And I often think of that too as a reminder not only to be overly dependent on others to assist me after disaster with things like security. When one of these primary utility infrastructure systems go down, it will be up to you and you alone whether or not you will make it through. Sure, there will be a repairman deployed to fix the system. There will be a police, fire, and medical personnel continuing to do their best in the face of the worst of it all. There may be even outside relief and support from the state and federal levels, but none of these are guaranteed. However, and the loss of what you take for granted now is measured in minutes and precious hours until it is hopefully restored. I would encourage you to take time to create an actionable plan for losing each of these critical utility infrastructure systems. Again, I'll post links below on practical videos to detail each of these issues. As always, stay safe out there.